like to introduce John Axe, who will introduce our speaker and session for today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Julianne. Uh, two weeks ago, we watched a talk by Nobel Prize winner Jennifer Doudna explaining a new and relatively easy technique called CRISPR for editing the genetic code of living cells. She made clear that the ability to edit human cells offers great promise for treatments or possibly eradication of inheritable diseases like sickle cell anemia. But then it also raises troubling ethical questions about designer babies with enhanced size or strength or different colored eyes or whatever. But today our speaker, Patricio Munoz, is going to talk about applying those techniques to plant genetics. If you toggle the phrase, Google the phrase uh, agricultural revolution, you find that it first applies to the historic, prehistoric transition from hunting and gathering to settled agriculture, which occurred 12,000 years ago. And those first farmers and each generation that followed them improved the plant genome by replanting the seeds from the plants with the best yield or the best drought resistance or prettier flowers. And then they learned the art of grafting, asexual plant propagation that joins parts from different plants together so that they will heal and grow as one plant. More recently, there was the Green Revolution associated with the name Norman Borlaug, the US agronomist who developed dwarf drought resistant and disease resistant grain crops and is sometimes credited with saving a billion people from starvation. And now Wikipedia says we are in the midst of the second green revolution. Now plant biologists have more knowledge of plant genomics and tools like CRISPR that allow them to design and grow specific crops with more desirable characteristics. Our speaker today, Professor Munoz, has a Bachelor of Science degree in forestry from Catholic University of Temuco, Chile, a master's in genetics and PhD in molecular breeding, both from the University of Florida. He now teaches gra graduate level courses and leads a team of, I think about 20 members in the Blueberry Breeding and Genomics Program of the University of uh, University Horticultural Science Department. He's collaborated in the development and release, at least according to his CV, with 10 new blueberry varieties, and maybe it's more now. Uh, and in 2017, he received the Richard Jones Outstanding New Faculty Research Award. And uh, as I just told Patricio, Richard, who's an Okamic resident, had intended to introduce you today, but had a last minute uh, conflicting appointment and sends his apologies. But now I'm going to turn it over to you, Patricio. Well, thanks, um, John. And, and again, um, uh, it's a pleasure to, for me to be here. Um, very glad um, that you invited me and to share what we do at the University of Florida and specifically at the um, Blueberry Breeding Program. Um, as I said, you know, uh, today I will, I will speak a little bit about myself, but you know, there is no work that we do without our team. So at first I just wanna congratulate my team because I mean, they are the ones that helped me to move everything that we do together and developing the new cultivars and develop the new knowledge that, that we do together. With that, um, I will be dividing the, the lecture or the talk today in, in four parts. The first one, I'm gonna speak a little bit about myself because again, I really believe that in order to trust the people that's talking, you really need to know where they are coming from, right? Secondly, um, in order for us to talk about CRISPR and all the technologies that we use in plant breeding, as again, as I said before, CRISPR is just one more tool that we have 
out of the dozens that we use in plant breeding. So in order for you to understand that, I'm gonna be uh, hopefully explaining to you what is plant breeding, how do we use it and why do we do it? Then thirdly, I'll be talking about the blueberries and our breeding program, because I cannot give a talk without talking about blueberries, right? Um, and finally, we're gonna talk about uh, CRISPR, some of the recent uh, revolution in, crop, in the crops as well, uh, some of the examples and how we are planning to use it in our program as well. So let's go into it. So first I would like to tell you a little bit about myself, you know. I grew up in the mountains in, in, in the Andes part of Chile, as you see in the, in, in the first top picture there. Um, you know, my dad was a cowboy. So then I, I basically, since I'm five years old, I, I'm been on top of a horse, you know, uh, helping him around moving cows and then planting crops, you know, uh, mostly for uh, substance, uh, subsist, subsistence, um, you know, uh, farming. After that, I did a bachelor's in, in forestry engineer in Chile, in the south part of Chile. So I work with forest trees and I work in a company as a breeder as well uh, during after my, my bachelor's. Then I moved here to the US, to Florida, um, Gainesville specifically, where I have been, you know, for the last 15 years. Here I did my ma uh, master in quantity genetics and my PhD in molecular breeding. All these things and all the time focus in plant breeding and how to understand better the new tools to be applying plant breeding and to do better the job that we do as plant breeders. I work is, uh, after that, I, I work as the forage breeder. In forages, uh, we try to produce um, grasses and legumes to feed um, cattle and horses, as you see in the photos there. And it was a fortunate also, I worked with a, a, a very good team and then we released a couple of cultivars uh, there that the, now the producers of Florida can use. After that, I moved to the um, horticultural science department where I currently work and work as a, to work as a blueberry breeder. Um, it's very satisfying working with crops that people eat um, because you can obtain feedback very fast. You know, there is no time that I'm not going around where people will talk to me about, you know, their preferences in blueberry or their experiences with blueberries. I always said, you know, um, when I start working with forest trees, I was always, you know, looking at plants like this. Then with forages, I was like that. My neck has some complications after going up and down all this time. So now with blueberries, you know, they are my eyesight. So it's much better for my for my health as well. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about plant breeding. So let's try to answer the question, what is plant breeding? Why do we need it? And how does it work? There's no better way to do this actually to look at this example. The plant on the top, Brassica leurasia, is wild mustard. And you see on the bottom, and actually there is probably a couple more uh, produce uh, nowadays you can buy in the supermarket. They have all been developed out of this single plant. Now this single plant that you can look and find sometimes some fields, you know, open fields, wild fields, you will look at it and it looks like nothing to you. It's just like a weed, right? But look at all the different products that have been developed because of plant breeding. So nowadays we have cabbage, Brussels sprout, kale, broccoli, cauliflower. This process is took a long time, you know? And in the process, you know, my predecessors, breeders, my colleagues, they were selecting for different plant structures to be able to form these um, new products, basically. Why do we do this? We do this because at the beginning of times, probably somebody out there saw some mutations, natural mutation in these plants that were looking more like one of these products on the bottom, right? And then it found interesting. And then, you know, also somebody else, somebody went there and tried them and found them tasty. And then 
With time, people start pushing into that direction, selecting plants into that direction, making crosses and selecting the progeny into that direction until they form what nowadays we have. Now, as you know, for example, in kales, we have many different types of kales and they're delicious, right? But <clears throat> to understand a little bit better the process of plant breeding and what do we do, Another very great example is what happened with potatoes, is what the example that you have, the photo that you have in the top left here in your screen. So that these are hundreds of varieties of wild potatoes that exist in the Andes. That's in the wild. Now, through the domestication and the early domestication of these crops, you know, the people in the past selected the best ones, the ones that produce the bulkiest potatoes, for example, or the tastiest, right? Because for the same amount of work that you need to do, then you will have your work will be more efficient, right? Now with time and more with modern techniques, as you see the photo in the top right, you know, we have been able to improve even farther that process of generating larger potatoes and potatoes are more efficient for the different type of industry. For example, if you wanna get a big baked potato to fill it up with, you know, with uh, cream cheese or with, um, I don't know, with onions or whatever you wanna put in there, you don't want a tiny skinny potato. You want those big chunky ones, right? But for other processes, whenever we're doing those soups or those small ones might be great because, you know, you enhance the flavor. Anyway, or for potato sheep industry, you know, that they need long and elongated, so then when they cut them, you know, they maximize the use of the produce and also there is no waste. So as you see in the bottom picture here, plant breeding, you can also think about it as about a funneling, you know, the best stuff from the wild species, you have huge variability in all these characteristics. In the early domestications, when the civilization starts settling, and then they start finding out that they could cultivate some crops, and then they start selecting the best ones. Year after year, as you were mentioning, they were doing plant breeding. And that's the early process of plant breeding, basically selecting for how they look, selecting for how much they yield, selecting for how well they survive. And then with modern techniques, we're able to even enhance that process even further. For what? Why do we do this? For the benefit of people, for the benefit of humanity. To understand a little bit further about plant breeding is very important. And then to understand the impact that CRISPR and all these technologies can have is very important that you understand the difference between this continuous variation and continuous variation. This continuous variation, and I imagine most of you had to study Mendel in, uh, during your uh, time of school. And then they were talking about the Mendel was, is, is considered the father of genetics, right? Because Mendel was the one that was able to uh, make experiments with plants to develop what we know about today, about like um, the theory of inheritance, right? And for example, by using the seed shape, the pot shape or the stem height, for example, he was able to separate and to understand how the genetic process passed from one generation to the next. Basically when, you know, the pollen and the egg in the plant, they mix together to form new individuals and then what is going to be happening in the next generation? Now, obviously, doing it with plants, it was a lot easier than with um, humans, right? Because in order to understand what is going to be the ratio, how many of the pots are going to be round and green? How many of the pots are going to be round and yellow or, or green and wrinkled? You need to have many of them. And that's why, you know, he was very lucky to actually work with plants that produce many seeds, but at the same time to work with characteristics that they were this that show this continuous variation. Most of these characteristics also were showing 
monogenic inheritance or what we call qualitative inheritance, which means that it's very easily to separate one characteristic to the other. For example, here, round or wrinkle or yellow and green. So in that case, he was able to understand what happened from one generation to another and what are the ratios that you should expect from one generation to another, right? However, in these cases, these characteristics are controlled by a single gene of very, very few genes. Like for example, that's why we call it monogenic that come from single gene. In the opposite scenario, we have characteristics that are polygenic characteristics that are controlled by many genes. And all of these genes contribute very tiny bit to the expression of how the final plant is gonna look or how the final human is gonna look or how the final animal is gonna look. So that's what we call the expression of these genes. So in this sense, most of the traits that we work with in plant breeding, in crop development are polygenic or quantitative. So each of the genes that we, each of the plants that, or the characteristics is controlled by many genes, each of them contributing a small effect to the final characteristic. On top of that, they are influenced by the environment. For example, the freeze that happens today is going to affect yield probably if it was able to clip uh, kill some of the flowers if we were not effic uh, efficient in protecting some of the flowers. And the final product that you're going to see regarding the yield of the plant is going to be affected by the capacity of the plant to produce fruit plus the environmental conditions that affect that, pro that fruit production. So in that sense, we say the plant breeding is a three-step process. Like I said before, we need to gather or we need to have germoplasts or a group of plants population that has enough variability to start with. In the second step, we identify the superior individuals. And then using traditional techniques, most of the time, we generate crosses among them. And then we plant the progeny outside and then we select the best ones and we do that again until we reach the desirable levels for the different characteristics. And finally, then we develop cultivars or varieties with these superior individuals that then we release out for the producers to produce the crops or the fruits or the vegetables. Now, as I explained to you before, if, for example, the freezes can affect you know, the capacity of the plant to yield, so is the type of soil that they are in or the amount of rain that they get, right? Or the amount of wind that might be able to blow some of the flowers. So the job that we have as plant breeders is to be able to separate what we say is the phenotype from the, gen the genotype from the environment, sorry. The phenotype is what you look, what you see. What you look at, you look at me and you're looking at my phenotype and the expression of all the genes plus the environmental um, effects that have over me over time, how much food that I ate, you know, the kind of food that I ate, the kind of diseases that I got by outside, you know, external factors. So this is my phenotype. The same thing, when you look at a plant, you look at the phenotype. However, the work that we have is to be able to separate what portion of what you see is due to the genetic variation or the genetic effect and what portion is due to the environment. Why is it so important to do this? Because we cannot replicate the environment whenever we make crosses, but we can track the inheritance of the genes from one generation to another. And in that sense, we can select for the genes that are more favorable for the different characteristics that we are selecting. So the breeding process or the breeding cycle more or less looks like this. We, hook, we put plants in the field, you know, under the conditions that we are looking to um, produce later whenever we do commercial production. Then we measure these characteristics 
once we measure this characteristic, now we have a lot of data, right? For example, how much plant one yield, how much plant two yield, what was the size of the fruit one, what was the size of the fruit two, and so on and so forth. With all this information, we make a statistical analysis, you know, and this is the area that's called quantitative genetics, to try to separate how much of this variation is due to the genetics and how much of this variation is due to the environment. And with that, then we rank the plants based on their genetic potential to be parents, basically. With that information, then we select the best individuals that have the highest potential to become parents for the next generation. And we use them to make crosses, right? And the process starts again, because with the product of this process, we obtain seeds. These seeds, we grow plants. These plants grow in the field. And then we measure again the characteristics of if we were successfully improving those traits or not. And then we do the analysis again. And basically, this cycle goes over and over again. Now, the process of plant breeding in this way to develop one cultivar, like you see here, it might take in the traditional format between 12 to 15 years. That's a very long time. If you think, for example, whenever we have a new disease, a new pest, or for example, now is an excellent example. Obviously, we don't do this with humans, but it's an excellent example with the pandemic, right? If we have a pandemic like in a plant or in a crops, for example, what's happening with citrus greening right now, I imagine that you are aware of, of that. Basically, it's a disease that's decimating the industry. Um, if we take 10, I mean, 15 to 18 years to develop a new variety that's resistant to this disease, it might be too late for the, for the producers, you know? For the normal people and for us that we don't rely on what's happening in that farm, it might not make a huge difference, but they are the ones producing the food and they might have huge impacts with that problem. So this process takes too long. With time, over time, we have been trying to come with different techniques. From the original times, we use visual selection, as I mentioned before. Basically, you look at the plants and look at the ones that, the best looking ones, you move them to the next generation. The problem with that, I explained to you, is that the effect of the environment, you cannot separate the effect of the environment with the true genetic potential of the plant. And for that, we have been using also quantity genetics or statistical genetics to separate these two things. Also, <clears throat> during time, and a lot in the past, it was used chemical and physical agents to create variation in crops that carry low genetic variability. Molecular information also is used to select plants, not to manipulate the molecular information, but we use it to select. For example, now the in humans, and the best example that you can have with this, you know that the BRCA gene for breast cancer, you can have a test, go to the doctor, you can do a test, and then you can know if you are carrying the allele that increases your chance to have breast cancer. So the same thing we do with plants. We do research to find out what genes carry what potential characteristic, for example, disease resistant. And so we can use this molecular information to decide, I'm gonna use this plant to make crosses because it has higher chances to generate progeny that are gonna be resistant to this disease. We also use genomic information and other omics information. You might have heard about that, so genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, phenomics. All these are just big words that they're basically trying to say that we use a lot of data to try to understand and to make better decisions regarding what plant to cross and which plants to select. And finally, we use molecular techniques to manipulate the plant genome in a way that also the same way that we have been doing, you know, for hundreds of years to manipulate the plant genome in a way that's beneficial for 
humans. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about blueberry. Where do they come from? The market that consumptions and the genetic variation and try tr some of the traits that matter from, from my point of view. So first, let me tell you, and this, some people might not know this, but blueberries and cranberries are cousins. They are relatives. They come from the same genus, you know, as well as bilberries and lingleberries. Now, there is around 200 to 400 species of vacciniums, which is the genus where uh, blueberries come from. And they carry all kinds of shapes and, and, and colors and characteristics. And you can find them at little plants like this, for example, as the low bush blueberry that grows in the north part of the country, right? Or very tall plants, you know, um, like for example, the vaccinium arboreum uh, or a sparkleberry that grows here in the southeastern US. Now, something that you know not, most people might not know, but blueberries could not be grown here in Florida or in the southeast in the past. Blueberries were domesticated in the early 1900s. And the major um, progress was made when actually they found out that they needed to have acidic soils in order for the blueberries to grow better. Without acidic soils, you know, they were able to bring plants from the wild, but they were not able to cultivate them. So basically the domestication, it happens, you know, in the 1900s and the major step was to use acidify the soil where you put the blueberries. And that's the traditional blueberry that is grown, you know, in New Jersey and in Michigan also Oregon and Washington. But that could not be grown here. Why? Two things, we didn't have enough winter. And the second thing, we have too many diseases and pests. Why? Because Florida is the, is the port of entrance basically for many pests and diseases um, through hurricanes that carry them or through trade. So my predecessors, you know, starting in the 1950, they used the northern varieties or vaccinium corymbosum as here in the left with larger fruit and good fruit characteristics and yield with native plants from, the, uh, from Florida. And this one is called vaccinium derawai or evergreen blueberry. It's a small bush with very tiny fruit and very tiny leaves. So they combine them and they cross it using traditional breeding techniques and that was done here at the University of Florida. After 20 something years of work, they were able to develop what we call today the Southern high bush or also low chilling blueberry. Basically, this is a combination of the Northern high bush with the wild species of Florida. <clears throat> this is how it looks now, very large and, and tasteful uh, fruit. Blueberries are very relevant because they carry many health benefits. Some of them, antioxidants, very relevant, anti-inflammatory, very relevant for the whole body, basically. Anti-proliferating, anti-obesity, neuroprotective properties. And there is a whole paper, you know, that they listed all the characteristics of blueberries in these articles in 2013. Nowadays, we have even more studies that have been carried to check different characteristics and, and, and benefits that blueberries have. And because of that, I'm gonna leave this uh, web page in the recording here today for anybody be able to access them, given that here they maintain a current information about the health benefits of blueberries. And this is through the US High Bush Council. So we have benefits cardiovascular, brain, exercise, or insulin, and good health. One of the most relevant, as I said before, is the antioxidant capac capacity of the blueberries and the anti-inflammatory that any disease or problem that you might have, the anti-inflammatory might come handy. Because of this, 
the blueberry consumption and production has been increasing tremendously over the years. And nowadays, you know, the US is the country that where more uh, blueberries are eaten nowadays, and we have a, a per capita consumption of about a little bit over two pounds per person. Now, when things go bad, when things are, you know, problematic or we get challenged, for example, with the current pandemic, people tend to even look more into produce that they carry health benefits. And this is a trend. People is looking to eat healthier because you wanna have a healthier life. You don't wanna go to the doctor, right? You wanna go to the doctor just to check and for them to say, you are good, you know, all good. Come back next year or come back in six months. Anyway, as I explained before, the process of developing a cultivar, it takes a long time. We have been finding many different ways to do this. However, <clears throat> plant breeding, we know it works in the traditional way and also with the aid of the new tools. For example, in this graph, you have in the y-axis, in this direction, you have the firmness of the fruit of the blueberries. And in the x-axis on the horizontal, you have the year where the blueberry was released as a cultivar. And you can see the trend as it increases over the years. Why? Because plant breeding works. And then we have been selecting for more firm blueberries. Why is this relevant? Because we don't wanna buy a clamshell of blueberries and find them very soft and mushy. We want them to be crisp and we want them to be um, tasty. Nowadays, this is the kind of plants that we put in the field, uh, product of our new, of our, all the different tools and techniques. And this is a cultivar, for example, that uh, we released my team in 2020. And obviously here the, the berries are not ripe yet, but I just want you to look how a plant, a plant that's producing in a commercial setting looks like. Our program in this sense has released more than 100 cultivars. And as you see, the ones in blue are the ones that the recent ones that we have released um, in, in the program. And they are selected for different characteristics, but mostly for productivity, their capacity to produce a good amount of blueberries so the producers can make money. Good fruit characteristics, that means size, firmness of the fruit, flavor, and appearance, and um, other flavorful components that I'm gonna be speaking about that in a sec. In that sense, nowadays we license the production of our blueberries, not just here in Florida, but all over the world. And the idea is that, you know, whenever the counter season blueberries comes, they also also come with better characteristics. In that sense, our program still uses, you know, wild species. For example, in this case, Vaccinium iliotii, as you see in the most right part of the picture, this is a wild species with tiny berries, but through the process of breeding in our program, we are able to introgress, or we are able to um, insert some parts of this species into the commercial production of blueberries. So now we can have, you know, some representation of the flavors and components of this species into the uh, blueberries. This is very relevant because in this case that I showed you before, Vaccinium iliotii, it carries some aromatic components. Now, flavor is something that is very complex because what I'm, I might like, you might not like it. And then you look at the person that you hide beside you and that person might not like what you like neither. And like that, flavor is very complex and subjective. Why is this? Because flavor is composed of different parts or is sense in different forms. For example, our tongue is able to taste sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. And those are the receptors that are in the tongue. But however, whenever you put some food in your mouth 
and you shoot it, there is certain volatile components, chemical, natural components that exist in the fruit, for example, in this case, blueberry, that they are going to go through the back of your mouth and they are going to go through the sensors that are in the base of the brain. And that's going to tell you, you're going to be thinking, hmm, this is so flavorful. You know, there is some tricks to separate, you know, what your tongue is feeling and what your sensors of the volatile components are feeling. And this is, for example, I imagine it happened to most of you whenever you had a cold in the past and you could not, you know, um, smell very well, you know, all those sensors were probably blocked. So whenever you don't feel the food tasting the same, right? Another easy trick is that you put some food in your mouth, you plug your nose and you shoo that. And then you're able to say, to, to sense what the tongue is tasting. And then you release your nose and then you're gonna be able to have a different experience with the food. You can do that with any type of food. Note that in here, I'm, ref I'm, ref I'm referring to two different things. The nasal smell is different to what I'm referring here which is, you know, the retronasal um, chemical components that go from the back of your mouth toward, you know, the sensors of your brain. So <clears throat> we do work with that. And for example, we are able to do large taste panels to understand what are the different chemical components that naturally exist in blueberries that people like the most. And for example, we know that sugars and acids play a big role, but these BOCs, which are stand for volatile organic components, again, natural products, natural chemical components of the blueberries, we were able to understand that they explain more because of this retronasal you know, sensation that I was explaining. And then we are able to select for them and to do a better work. So whenever you eat into your blueberries, you have a much happier experience. In the, same, in the same sense, we have some blueberries that carry these aromatics and some others that cannot. We did larger studies, you know, to when we as blueberry experts select some of the blueberries that have aroma and some that do not, and then we gave them to consumers. And they, we, the, one of the first questions we were asking, can consumers identify these components the same as we can? or this sensation. And then yes, the consumers can perceive them. And then the second question is, do they like them better? And the answer was yes as well. And so we have to work to identify the chemical origin or the molecular origin of these components to again, to do better what we do. In this case, we did found that, like I explained to you before, some characteristics are monogenic controlled by single gene and others are polygenic controlled by multiple genes. In this case, we were able to identify these characteristics are monogenic. So little changes into the genome or the genes that affect, will affect significantly the aromatic components. Other characteristics that we are working heavily is post-harvest. Again, because you don't wanna fight uh, blueberries in the supermarket that, you know, they are coming mushy and then they start decaying uh, very fast. Also, anthocyanins. Blueberries is one of the fruits and veggies that carry the highest levels of anthocyanins. And that's where the, you know, the antioxidant capacity uh, comes from. And so we keep working into increasing even further these components. Because my goal, my personal goal, given the job that I'm doing, is that in the future, we are able to eat one handful of blueberries per day, and it will act as to protect us from many um, diseases, potential diseases that we can, uh, they can affect us. At the same time, you know, another way to increase anthocyanins or to change the chemical composition of anthocyanins is use other wild species that exist here in the US. Here in the picture, 
you see in the bottom left, you see a hybrid between the traditional blueberry. The traditional blueberry is the one, you know, um, big and whitish greenish in the center. That's the traditional blueberry that we eat. The one in the left is a cross that was done with a wild species that internally carry the purple or red color. Internally in that purple and red color, they carry a different composition of anthocyanins that can be beneficial for human as well. So we are working to introgress these characteristics in the commercial um, blueberry that you buy in the supermarket. So finally, we got to the point of <clears throat> what is CRISPR? How do we work? How does it work? And some examples of animal and plant, in, in, and plant breeding and potential uses in blueberries. Now, I know that you have Jennifer Dodna coming and talking to you about what CRISPR is. So I'm not gonna spend much time given that you have the, you know, the highest expert talking to you in this area. But from the point of view of plant breeding, I'm gonna be telling you, what you see in this diagram, this scheme, in the upper left is what traditional breeding look like if each of these, you know, little, these two sticks represent the chromosomes of the plant and each of those bubbles represent genes on the plant, right? We have between, you know, 25,000 to 30,000, um, 35,000 genes. Plants carry the same number, more or less. It depends on the plant, of course, it depends on the crop. But if you have a plant that has 40,000 genes, whenever you make a cross between two varieties, as is, um, is shown here in this upper left photo, you are affecting right away the 40,000 genes. They mix up and they recombine. Whenever genetic engineering was proposed and it was used, it has been used in the past as well to generate uh, cultivars that now they exist and then they are used by producers all over the globe, more or less. What they are doing in that case, they were affecting one gene out of this 40,000. The difference with gene editing is that within one of these genes, you can have hundreds or thousands of these letters that compose the DNA code. And with gene editing, the idea is to edit one, two, three, up to five or 15. I have, I have not seen a studies where you, know, you are modifying more than 15. So again, as technology progress, we understand more. And we, from the point of view of trying to help you know, the humanity by developing better varieties, we're trying to use this technology um, for the good of humanity as well. How does this technology works to do that editing of those few bases, base pairs in the genome is that we design, you know, guide RNAs, which are little pieces of sequences that match a given part of a gene that we want to modify. Then you put this together with certain proteins inside the cells, and then there is different ways to do that. Once they are inside the cell, both of them combine actually to identify that part of the genome or that gene, and then just to do a nick, they do a cut. Whenever they do that cut, basically the DNA breaks. And this can happen for other reasons as well. And that's the case that plants and humans and animals, they have a special machinery inside that will go and fix that break. But whenever the break is a little bit larger, they never is never fixed properly. So there is a small change that happens whenever that break is fixed. And in that way, you disrupt a gene. And for example, it could be a gene that allows the susceptibility to certain disease or pests. And so if that's the case, now the plant is going to be resistant to that pest or disease. Other examples where these technologies are used, for example, in animal breeding. You know, we know that uh, certain type of cows 
carry horns. And this is problematic because in the, some of the industries, as soon as these uh, cows are babies, they will go and physically cut the horns of these baby uh, cows. cows. Um, that's very traumatic, but it has to be done because otherwise, you know, as whenever they are older, they could damage each other by fighting. On the other hand, you have certain uh, cows that they are, um, they don't have the horn because they have some genetic mutation that naturally happened in the past. And so they don't have this problem of, you know, so, but if we use traditional breeding in this case, we are gonna have what, you know, Kevin Folta put here, you know, is a, is a great speaker, by the way. And basically you have, you are gonna end up with a mix of bad beef, bad milk production, um, and potentially horns or no horns because it's gonna be segregating. It's gonna be, you're gonna have progeny with different types. So in that sense, by using gene editing, and this happened already, they were able to generate little babies or little calves that actually were able to eliminate the horn uh, gene, and now they don't need to go physically cut them, the horn. So this is one of application. Um, and obviously it's a, a lot less traumatic experience for these uh, animals. By 2015, genetic engineering uh, crops have been spread um, in many countries. And nowadays, if this uh, graph was updated, it's been spread even more. Why? Because um, we as plant breeders, we have our mission. Our mission is to improve crops. That's what we do. And then societies have been understanding that um, these improvements, they are necessary to do better what we do regarding, you know, climate change, because we are not responsible with, we particularly, the plant breeders, we are not responsible for climate change, but we need to be developing crops that are sustainable in this uh, current um, environment. There's many examples then in, in, in plant breeding where gene editing has been used. And this is the case of citrus canker, a disease that's caused by a virus that gets into the plant and is decimating you know, the production of, of, of fruit. And in this sense, gene editing or CRISPR was used <clears throat> to modify the, the plant genome and generate plants that are resistant to citrus canker. This has been replicated now in the US and as well in China. High anthocyanin tomato. Oh, well, sorry, I should have probably said here that in this case, the way to combat this uh, is through um, <clears throat> antibiotics. And then that's very detrimental for, you know, for the environment to use high, high um, amounts of antibiotics in plants. And so generating a plant that's resistant, naturally resistant to citrus canker without having to use antibiotics is the benefit for the producers, but also for the consumers. Another example, and then I imagine most of you have seen because these kind of things like this, they come in the news as soon as they are developed. Some investigators, some researchers, you know, they were able to <clears throat> uh, modify the tomato to be uh, generate the purple color. Why is this relevant? is kind of the same reason why we eat blueberries. We eat blueberries and we eat so much of them because they are healthy, they are benefit. They, these anti anthocyanins, antioxidants are beneficial for us. So by doing this, now we potentially could eat a tomato that also would carry the same benefit. Same has been the case of cassava, as, you know, very important crop in some countries, potatoes, bananas, all these crops are very important in some countries because they're, you know, they're a staple and they're, they're, their survival of, of the people is based on these countries, in these uh, crops, I'm sorry. <clears throat> As I said before, also, 
I believe in climate change. If you believe or not, climate is being different. And then we need to be prepared to that. And so these technologies also allow us to act faster. For example, in this case, developing saline tolerance uh, rice, or also drought tolerance in maize. Also, that has been used using CRISPR. All these crops are out there now. In the case of blueberries, genetic engineering has not been used yet to generate cultivars. There is no blueberry that has been modified that exists in the market nowadays. It has been used only for research purposes. And we also use it for research purposes to understand what the different genes do. And for example, for you to understand what I'm saying here, if we, if we go and use these technologies to turn off a gene, and then we look at what happened with the plant, now we can understand what the gene was doing, right? And that's the way for us to understand if we just need, if we do need to select for that gene or not in the future. However, fruit fairness and post-harvest are huge problems. Why? Harv fairness fruit, it can be harvested by machines reducing cost of labor. Labor is a huge problem nowadays for uh, farmers and producers. Huge problem, not just because it's expensive, but it's because it's not accessible anymore. There is, everybody is fighting to find uh, people to work for them. So if we are able to develop blueberries that they have even high firmness, and actually they can be harvested by machines, it's not only a safe for the <clears throat> in cost for the farmer or for the producer, but also is a more sustainable way to do it. In that sense, also the second problem is post-harvest. Once this fruit is harvested, if the fruit is firmer, it will last longer and it will be less waste. Basically, you're not gonna be throwing away fruit that gets um, uh, mushy very fast. The second one, <clears throat> while we are studying this, different anthocyanins in the wild species, we're trying to understand what are the genes that cause this purple flesh. So we can use this technology directly into the commercially <clears throat> produced blueberry. And then again, it's gonna be health benefits uh, for the community. Pests and diseases, <clears throat> are a huge issue for the industry, not just for blueberries. And to fight this, you know, farmers had to use a spraying of different fungicides and chemicals to try to still be able to produce a fr uh, fruits or produce and so be profitable and at the same time producing the fruit and veggies that we all eat. Now, this is an area where this technology could have a huge impact because as been shown in the past, whenever disease or pest resistant uh, crops are being developed, there is immediately, immediately is followed by a decrease in pesticides uses in the crop production system. So <clears throat> we are not using any type of genetic engineering or programs nowadays. We are all using it to understand better the crops that we are developing. Now, we all hope that in the future we can use this or any other technology to develop products that are gonna be better for all of us. And with that, <clears throat> I would like to say, you know, stay healthy, eat blue, and I will be very happy to answer questions if there is some, and thank you for your attention. Uh, here is some of the information about our program if you want to find more information about what we do. John, back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Patricio. <laughs> that was uh, uh, a very interesting and uh, information packed uh, presentation. There, there are, I have several questions, but there's also a bunch of hands up. Uh, Julianne, I'm going to let you handle the questioning. Okay, let's 
take one from chat. It says, what is your opinion concerning plant engineering that is aimed for the seeds to commit suicide and thus, thus not be useful to grow future crops? Yes. Um, I don't know what you mean by commit suicide. I'm not familiar with that, but I can tell you um, plant breeders using different technologies. And one of them, especially in some crops, and I think there is a lot of controversy about this, but uh, we just need to have a little bit of understanding. In some crops, you can have what we call inbreds. So they are plants that they are breed to concentrate the genes on one kind and concentrate the genes of the other, right? Whenever you cross them, you generate what is called a hybrid. Right, and these seeds of these hybrids are what, uh, uh, for example, in corn, they plant these hybrid seeds, right? And then you can have great crops, large plants with big production. What happened is that the progeny of those hybrids will never be able to produce what that hybrid produced. Why? Because it's just a matter of genetic inheritance. In this one, you have, for example, you know, we have two chromosomes, so we carry two genes for each specific position in the genome. So in this case of the corn, for example, one of them has the big A and the other one has the little A. Like I imagine most of you that study, you know, in the school, they taught you about Mendel and the genetic inheritance or whatever. So when it, only when you have the big A with the little A together in the genome, you have what is called hybrid vigor and the plant produce large crops and big ears of corn. If however, you collect the seeds of these plants, they are gonna be segregated now for all kinds. So you're gonna have big A's with big A's, big A's with little A's and so on and so forth. So what happened is that you're gonna obtain a very crappy crop in the next generation. But it's not done because of, you know, the plants commit suicide or whatever, it's just because genetically the industry was made in a way that you, you can obtain the highest yield and production in the generation of hybrids. And there is ways to recover the, those hybrids and, and so on and so forth, but um, I'm not familiar with this seed suicide thing that um, you are mentioning. Tammy, did that answer your question or do you wanna unmute and clarify? Yeah, thank you. I was referring to what Monsanto was doing with corn and rice that uh, uh, they did some uh, uh, plant engineering in a way that uh, farmers uh, grow the corn and rice, but then the next year those uh, seeds are uh, not fertile anymore and they cannot grow with them anything. And it was discovered not on a purposeful way, but uh, as people just uh, started growing and, and discovered that they cannot use the, the, the seeds for the next year. Mm. Yeah, I, I, Tammy, I, I understand your, your concern and your question. Uh, but again, um, that I'm aware no such a thing exists. I know there is a lot of things in social media. What exists is what I'm telling you is that, uh, and then the best way for you to test that is just grab some of the seeds from the plants of the supermarket, and then you're gonna see what I'm talking about. If you uh, extract seeds, you just put in the garden and you're gonna see that there's gonna be huge variation from plant to plant. It's not that the plants are not able to produce, it's just that it's crappy in the next generation. Why? Not because they have an insertion of something genetics in them. It's just because of the um, basic genetic uh, variation in the inheritance of the plants. Mm -hmm. Now, what they did do is the insertion of the VT gene using genetic engineering. This is a gene that actually, whenever the insects chew on them, you know, it generates a toxin that kills the insect. And that way, you know, there's a huge decrease in um, use of, um, pesticides to kill the, this pest. Now, also there is a lot of controversy and the people believe that that can affect us, but it doesn't because that's specifically designed to kill insects that carry a totally different gut system that we do. So it doesn't affect us. 
And that's is being used for, for many years already. And in the early years, there was a lot of concern and people was worried about what the effects that this could happen. Uh, until nowadays, there is no information that this, or there is no genetic, I mean, there is no studies that show that this could be uh, causing negative effects in human health. Thank you. Hi, right, Richard Petway, go ahead, your question. Thank you for a very um, understandable um, lecture. Um, and uh, what a great topic blueberries are, as I'm an over consumer. I wonder, I have uh, two specific questions. One, do you know a producer, local producer from Earlton, Florida, by the name of Longnecker? Have you ever uh, heard of uh, Longnecker? Uh, long he produces um, uh, blueberries in Lake Santa Fe area, um, near Earlton, Florida. Do you, do you know, have you ever heard of him? I don't know him personally, but I'm most likely probably I know about the farm. You know, I usually know the farm names and then that's the way I used to, to track them back. But let me tell you that we do, one of the things that we do in our program at the end of every season, you know, between June and September, we visit every farmer in Florida, every single one of them, to find out what were the problems of the production of the season, what were the challenges, what were the things that worked, and what were the things that didn't work. And with all that information, we give it to all our colleagues, researchers, to do better what we do. So I'm pretty sure that we have them into our data records of, of you know, their production that they have. But, um, I can. I do not recall the, the name. Okay, uh, just a brief uh, uh, relationship. Um, when Mark, my wife and I were teaching at uh, Michigan State University, uh, she decided to take a horticultural course from Professor Longnecker, who uh, famously studied all the blueberry productions and he wanted to, when he retired from Michigan State, wanted to get out of the cold weather and move south and produce blueberries that he was an expert in propagating. And so he did a study <laughs> of all places, uh, Gainesville and Earlton, Florida, which is uh, the, uh, along the east, west bank of Lake Santa Fe. Um, and he chose to come here to produce. So it was just an interesting story that uh, my wife was a horticultural class uh, from Professor Longnecker, and then we now buy blueberries from Professor Longnecker. And you know, that's one of the first areas of production of the, of the new type of blueberries that I'm talking about, you know, because uh, in reality, blueberries probably something that I should have told you, you know, there is, um, you in the supermarket go and buy blueberries, but they are three different species in reality. The, how, the northern high bush, the southern high bush, and also the rabbit eyes that they call them. But in the supermarkets, the, all of them, they are sold as blueberries. For the uh, non-expert, you know, eye, they all look the same and taste similarly, but, um, we can tell some differences whenever you know they are very evident. Um, well, sorry, and also the, the, the low bush. So there is four different species in reality. The low bush are the ones that are grow just like this high in the north part of the country. And then instead of being pig, actually they are rake from the ground. You know, I don't know if you have seen photos of some rakes that they use and then they rake them from the ground. When they are all mature, you you see a full field of blue. And then they are picked by hand with a rake. And it's very, very beautiful and interesting how different the species. And at the end of the day, is is different cousins, right? All these are different cousins within the, the genus. But yeah, that's uh, Erlington was one of the uh, areas that they start producing early here in, in, in Florida. So thanks for, for the remark. Thank you very much. Dr. Munoz, are you doing okay on time? We have quite a few questions left. 
I, I do have time for you guys. No problem. Okay, so there's one in chat that says, is there any progress being made in the citrus screening disease? I wish I can tell you, it's not my area of expertise because I don't know work with citrus. So I will be responsible to tell you. I have here and read, uh, probably as many of you do, because this problem is so huge that it comes in the news quite often, right? So I know that nowadays I'm talking by my colleagues that there is some um, production techniques that they are using to try to maintain production. For example, I know that they are using a uh, low release of nutrients, fertilizers, to maintain the plant more vigorous. And so it doesn't decay that fast. There is a lot of progress, a lot of, no, so no progress, a lot of research that is being done nowadays with all kinds of technologies and, and, and techniques um, and methodologies. Why? Because this problem is so huge Florida was the number one producers of, of citrus um, in the country, or maybe globally at one point. And now the production is decaying and they, it's so sad to travel to Central and South Florida where you are driving and you see all those groves just um, dying, huge groves of citrus dying. Um, we need a solution and we need it fast. And we hope that the technology can help with this. But up to now that I know, um, my colleagues, for example, I was last week into last or two weeks ago, I was in a release of new cultivars, my colleagues that work in citrus. And the information that they have is that these ones, these plants that they were releasing, they were more tolerant to the citrus. Or during the time that they have observed that they, they have not died, but there is still no hard evidence to say that these are going to be resistant, completely resistant to the disease. I hope that's uh, answered that. Um, it's satisfying, but I don't have more information than that. Thank you, Walter, go ahead. Uh, good morning, thank you very much for your discussion. Uh, when I was a little boy in the mid 1940s, uh, we visited my grandfather, my father's father up in the panhandle in the north end of it, very close to Alabama. And my grandfather and my uncle had what I called blueberry trees at that time because they seemed to me very very big they were probably six feet or more tall and the blueberries were very large but not all that uh, tasteful they seemed to be a little mealy yes yeah, so walter probably um as i mentioned there is many different species of um plant trees that they are going to produce fruit that they look like blueberries. Uh, most likely the ones that you are talking about is what we call uh, uh, rabbit eyes, which is vaccinium ashi. It's also a cousin of the blueberry that we usually buy in the supermarket. And sometimes whenever they have good quality, the new varieties that have been generated through time, they are sold in the supermarket also as blueberry. But if you go into the forest, basically you are tapping into the wild variability that exists in the species. And so while from one bush, you can pick excellent fruit, for the next one, you can pick something that is like completely disgusting. Um, whenever we, in my program, I can tell you, you know, whenever the season is on, which is usually in April is the peak of the season, because we make crosses, basically we're mixing all the genomes of these different plants. In the traditional way, we make crosses. So what if we obtain afterwards, it's like huge variability of plants. Whenever I have to taste that fruit, I usually do it with a bucket beside, because some of them are so disgusting that I have to spit them out of right away. <laughs> so in that way, we, we, we like to call ourselves that we are the gatekeepers for, you know, for taste. So you guys don't have to suffer that process <laughs> because it's not, it's not a good process, <laughs> I'm telling you. Um, it's, no, it's, it's not something nice to see when I'm doing this, neither. <laughs> uh, but some of them, you know, and then obviously I have a system for rating them and those get a zero right away. <laughs> okay, Shirley, I see your question in chat, but I'm not clear on it. I can read it as is, as is or you can ask your question. Oh, yeah, I, I think I probably can understand that. So okay. I think Sherry is asking for uh, supplements for antioxidants. Yes. 
I believe they exist, Jerry. I'm not involved in that process. So I'm involved in the process of generating new varieties. So once these varieties are produced, uh, there is some companies, what they do is that they grab the fruit and they extract the antioxidants. And they usually put them in supplements, in liquids or in pills, and then, uh, then you can buy them in the supermarket. Now it's very important then whenever, or in the, in the pharmacy, but whenever you do this is that you read very well that actually they are, you know, extracts from uh, uh, blueberries. So if you wanna have those benefits. How, how, what do you mean read very well? How do you know? It's gonna say in the, in the you know, in the, in the frask. Um, Is it beneficial know, to do that, do you think, for health? Excuse me? Is it beneficial to do that, do you think, for health? At this point, I can give you my personal opinion. So all these studies that you see, whenever they say blueberries are good for you in this way or that way, right? And then I, I put the information here. I Hopefully, you guys can explore it on your own. Um, these studies are usually done by uh, extract of blueberries. So they grab the blueberries, they, you know, they extract the, the antioxidants and they try to homogenize them. So otherwise, you know, there will be too much variability from a bunch of fruit to a bunch of fruit. So they try to homogenize them and then to give the uh, same dose to the people that they are trying them to see the, the benefits. Um, I believe, yes, any way that you can eat them is going to be beneficial for you. That's my personal opinion. You're, you're better to eat the blueberries. Sure. <laughs> I believe so too. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great talk. Thank you, Sarah. I see that you yeah. unmuted. Do you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, I'm not muted. No, I see that you unmuted. Go ahead. Uh, yes, yes, I did. Yes, I want to. Go ahead. Can I? Yes, ma'am. Patrice, you're so nice to hear your talk, especially because I'm from Chile. I'm very proud that a Chilean did such a wonderful job. <laughs> uh, clear, fantastic presentation. And I know how important is your work. And uh, you. the, the question I have is that, um, well, Chile export blueberries. And I would like to know if they have a good or high content of the antioxidant. Well, thanks for your words. Um, <clears throat> so the blueberries that they produce, they are the same ones that we produce. You just need to flip the country around, right? So then the <laughs> ones that we have, we do produce here in the south, they produce there in the central and north part of the country. And the ones that we produce here in the north, they produce in the south. Uh, but they are the same type. They are the same cultivars and then they are the same varieties, basically. So the... Uh, only difference that some of the selection process is done by the fruit that can travel. That's the way they, they refer to. So basically they, you put them in a boat and actually when I arrive here, it's still in good shape. So then there is an additional selection process there to uh, select fruit that is still tastes good after 20 or 30 days in a boat, but okay. it's the same fruit. What happened with the antioxidants uh, most likely, most of them are still going to be there because they are carry, you know, antioxidants and tocinins are the colorful fruit. You know, any fruit or veggie that they are uh, bluish, purplish, are going to have anti antioxidants. So in this case, whenever you still get the fruit, they're still obviously blue. And then uh, most of those antioxidants are still going to be there. So, all right. That was my concern because I'm from Chile from the north, by the way. Yeah. So you are from the south. But I was concerned about you know, the time, if they fly them in or et cetera, but um, yeah. and the no, they, are, they are still good. They are still good. Well, yeah. well, I wish you a lot of success with your projects. And I, I'll talk to you later about our country. <laughs> of course. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Keith. And then John Axe, you'll be after Keith. Yes, I have uh, one quick question uh, with, and a second more serious question. The first question is, how in heaven's name did you make the change from cows to blueberries in your career? From, from cows to blueberries? <laughs> <laughs> that, that seems like a pretty dramatic shift. Well, I mean, growing in a farm, you know, I mean, it's a... Um, 
my my grandfather has all this uh, orchard with so many different fruits and trees that I was climbing like probably many of you to try to get the fruit and, and eat the, the freshest fruit there. Uh, once I start being a breather working with forest trees, um, <clears throat> I, I got in love with this profession and then uh, I really like to work that, to make an impact. Uh, when I was working with forages, I quickly I realized that the cows will not give me good feedback. <laughs> you know, so uh, I needed to work in a crop where the feedback was uh, more readily available. And so I always wanted to work with food or fruit. And, and that's the way I end up working with blueberries, Basil. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, uh, the other um, more related question is, uh, more serious question was, uh, uh, when you talk about crossing uh, to to uh, uh, plants, to, to how do you decide which two to put together? I mean, what kinds of uh, decisions are made that they say, "Oh, these are the two I should cross"? Yeah, that's the most important part of the job. You know, the second most important is afterwards select which ones carry the, the good characteristic. Um, I spend a lot of time actually deciding which ones to cross. But nowadays we use a lot of um, statistical genomics because we do measure. So we, just to, to, for you to understand, we have these plants in the field, we measure their characteristics, and then we do analysis, you know, statistical analysis to sort them out, which ones are better than others. But at the same time, to sort out what is the portion of this better performance that is due to the genetic portion. So if it's due to the genetic portion, whenever you use that as a parent, it's gonna pass it to the next generation. And that's the important part. So then we spend a lot of time measuring, you know, quantifying the characteristics in the field and in the lab, you know, fruit quality characteristics. Um, last season, for example, I can tell you, we measure 5,000 samples of, you know, um, in the lab. So we have people working for over three months measuring different uh, fruit characteristics in the lab. And with that way, we can sort, you know, very easily which ones are the best ones that we need to use for crossing for the next generation. Thank you for your Thank question. Thank you very much. Very good talk. Go ahead, John. I, do, do you want to get David first and then I will finish off? Okay. David and then John. David, okay. Thank you so much for this talk. It really enlightened me, but I need a little more enlightenment. So when we buy cherries, they come with their stems attached. When we buy grapes, their stems are in a cluster. When we buy blueberries, there are no clusters and no stems. Why is that? Does this have anything to do with genetic engineering? Uh, sorry, what is your name? David. David, no. The short answer is no. And I can explain you why this happens. Um, and actually, you know, for example, if they could find ways that the pears, for example, did not come with a stem, probably they will do it. Why? Because they have short, very stiff stems that damage the fruit beside them whenever they rub against each other. In the case of blueberries, they naturally detach. So you have the fruit and what we call the pedicel, right? There is some fruit that they detach in the part that they attach to the plant. So to the trunk of the plant to say so. Like for example, when you pull the cherries, you get this. When you pull a blueberry, you get the fruit by itself. Now, we in the process of selecting for berry characteristics, whenever you grab a blueberry in the back part, and I don't have any, oh yes, yes. let me look at this one here. Okay, so this is my model right here. So whenever you detach a blueberry from the plant, this part on the back is what we call the scar. So we in the process of selecting for better fruit, we try to select for a scar that is dry, and small. So whenever the fruit gets detached, this is not open to allow diseases to enter or to allow the fruit to start leaking 
their juices outside. So then through the process of plant breeding, traditional plant breeding or using technology, we try to improve this even more. The detachment of the stem from the fruit is used, is, it varies so much from fruit to fruit and it's used natural. Thank you. Of course. All right, John, you're the grand finale. Okay. Um, I had uh, one question about uh, the importance, the economic importance of blueberries. When, when I think of uh, 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 agricultural pr production, it's what I naturally think of oranges, right? Yep. Um, wh what, what is the the economic value of for all of Florida for blueberries compared to oranges? Oof, uh, economic value can be seen in different ways. But uh, for example, I mean, one easy way to see it is that you have, I think, 200,000 or a little bit more acres of uh, citrus in the state. Uh, in the case of blueberries, just 5,000. So that's probably uh, one of the, the ways that you can see it right away, right? Uh, but anyway, we produce uh, in, the, in, in Florida, we produce around 20,000 uh, million pounds of blueberries in the early part of the season. And um, we obtain a prime uh, in, the, in the price because we are the first one to produce in the States. So I was just looking this morning, you know, the average price that comes back to the producer in the Florida is sometimes even twice as much that all um, other states get. Why? Because we are the first one to produce when there was no much fresh fruit in the, in the country. Uh, I, I assume blueberries are all picked by hand. Is that correct? And we are working very, and that's correct. And we are working very hard to develop uh, new varieties that can be picked by machine because of all the issues that we're having with uh, labor nowadays. It's not just here, it's everywhere. And it's a huge problem for, for farmers and producers. Um, so nowadays, probably there is a portion, I will say, I will guess that it will be between 10 and 20% of the fruit that gets picked by machine that it still goes to fresh market. Because if we consume it soon, enough has been picked by machine, you don't notice the difference. But whenever it's maintained for a very long time, you start noticing the difference. We don't need that, you know. In average, the fruit that we harvest here in the state, in Florida, is consumed between seven and 10 days. So that's enough, not enough time for the fruit to start showing any uh, marks of the, oh. of the machines um, being harvested. But again, we are working very hard to try to produce more that they are harvested by, by machine, hopefully in the near future. Huh? Good. All right. Uh, if there are no more questions, I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Professor Munoz for a, a, a talk that generated a lot of interest and a lot of questions. And uh, we're so happy to have you give this talk today. Very Our speaker happy. next week will be Dr. William Allen, who's a professor of community health at UF. And he's going to talk about ethical concerns involving genetic modification. So I hope you'll tune in next week. And thank you again, Professor Munoz. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye thank you, Dr. Thank Munoz. You.